Welcome to HRC Law Class. I'm your brother, Kasafo. And I'm your brother, Zakwa. Hope you all are enjoying the day and enjoying the series of edification and all the other edification on the website and on the YouTube channel and via Instagram and TikTok with Zakwa did it again. Hope it's profitable, helpful. If you like it, share it. If you love it, share it. <laughs> and I'll hire props for you. <laughs> and make sure y'all check out Hebrew Readers Church also on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. Uh, we are going to be posting more coming up on that channel. So just stay tuned. And I'm your brother, Kasafo. I already said my name, Kasafo. Okay. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> With that, let's jump into today's law class. The sixth commandment, thou shalt not kill. Let's get edification on this. The definition of murder. The English definition is the unlawful premeditated killing of one human being by another. Also, kill someone unlawfully and with premeditation. Let's look into the law on these things. Exodus 21 and 12, please. He that smiteth a man so that he die shall surely be put to death. That's premeditated. That's murder. Continue, please. And if a man lie not in wait, but Elohim deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whether he shall flee. That's a mishap where involuntarily someone dies and it happens without the intent to harm, that's not worthy of death. Continue, please. But if a man come presumptuously upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, then thou shalt take him from mine altar that he may die. Slaying with intent is murder, and murder is to die for according to the law. But slaying in itself is not an act worthy of death, depending on the situation. All right, so we've been learning everything's about the heart and intent, and we're getting to see it in the laws of Allah. Hayyam. Let's look at some situations. Can you read Exodus 22, verse 2, please? If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. That's not a slain worthy of death, as it's in self-defense of one's property. Slaying for self-defense is not a sin in the sight of Allah Hayyam, as good men have taken lives and were counted righteous like Levi and Samuel, for example. Of course, we also get to see with Levi and Samuel obeying Allah Hayyam's voice is always the right thing to do. Okay. <clears throat> Can you read Testament of Asher chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, please? Mm -hmm. For good men... Even they that are of single face, though they be thought by them that are double faced to sin, are just before Allah. Hayyam. For many in killing the wicked do two works of good and evil, but the whole is good because he hath uprooted and destroyed that which is evil. So there we see in killing, two things are happening when you're killing righteously. We're not talking about murdering. Murdering is just wrong. That's worthy of death. But having to slay, there's a good and evil. But as a whole, when Allah weighs it in the balance, it's actually good because you have uprooted and destroyed that which is evil. That's important for understanding that self-defense, if someone dies, it's actually not a bad thing that was done in the sight of Allah Okay. Thus you have David and Samuel were righteous, though they slew the wicked, because the law does not forbid slaying righteously altogether, but it forbids slaying someone with ill intent. Okay. And Zach, I'll jump in, if you will, mm -hmm. if there be. Exodus 20 and 13, please. Thou shalt not kill. Definition of kill is H7523. It's a primitive root properly to dash in pieces. That is, kill a human being. 
or kill generally, especially to murder. This is why we went into understanding murder versus slaying someone. It's two different things. And the laws, especially pertaining to murder itself, put to death, kill, manslay, slay, or manslayer, murder, murderer. Now, let's look at laws pertaining to killing for edification. Let's look at death of a person or animal or death by a person or animal. Exodus 21, verse 8, please. If an ox gore a man or a woman that they die, then the ox shall surely be stoned, and his flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the ox shall be quit. That's a death that happened by chance without prior warning signs, so the owner isn't liable to die, but his beast must be put to death for the act that it committed. All right, continue, please. But if the ox will want to push with his horn in time past, and it hath been testified to his owner, and he hath not kept him in, but that he hath killed a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned, and his owner shall also be put to death. The owner's negligence to keep his beast in makes him also responsible to die too. And he could also pay for the deed done to save his life at least. Can you read Exodus 21 and 30, please? If there be laid on him a sum of money, then he shall give for the ransom of his life whatsoever is laid upon him, whether he have gored a son or have gored a daughter. According to this judgment shall it be done unto him. So there's whatsoever price the parents require on the going between the judges was ordained. That's what he shall pay. Now, specifically, if it's a servant, the price is already set. Um, can you read the next verse, please? If the ox shall push a manservant or a maidservant, he shall give unto his master 30 shekels of silver, and the ox shall be stoned. Okay. Now, if a person kills a beast, transition to another variable. Let's see what the laws are for that. Exodus 21, 33, please. If a man shall open a pit, or if a man shall dig a pit and not cover it, and an ox or an ass fall therein, the owner of the pit shall make it good and give money unto the owner of them, and the dead beast shall be his. So you see in the law, you're responsible for it because we ought to be seeking out the well-being of others too. If I made a pit, I should cover it for everyone's safety so that no one gets hurt. Therefore, if someone's beast fall in there, I'm responsible to um, make it good with that person by paying them the money that they owed for that beast. Okay? There's so much responsibility and accountability with Alahayim. Like, you can't just say, oh, I'm, I dig the pit and it's not my fault. You shouldn't have fell in it. Right. You know, or my ox may have pushed before and then you don't take the proper precautions to take responsibility or accountability for what's going on with the ox to put them in. And then if it happens again, you're accountable for it. Though the ox did it, you're accountable for it because you're its master, you know? So like there's so much responsibility and accountability with Allah and serving Allah So it's interesting. Yeah, he's not an enabler. No, it's not. Praise him. Now you see the situation where due to negligence, someone got hurt still responsible now also if there's an outright situation where a person just kills someone else's beast they're liable for that too can you read leviticus 24 and 18 please he that killeth a beast shall make it good beast for beast all right you can kill his ox give him your ox okay 
Now, of course, variables, if his oxes want to push and his ox attacks you and you defend yourself, <laughs> you're not liable for that. He should have kept his ox in. All right. <laughs> so, you know, there's scenarios to it. Now, in the scenarios, the slayer has to make it good and pay for it to the owner, as we saw beast for beast. Can you read Leviticus 24 and 22, please? He shall have one manner of law as well for the stranger as for one of your own country, for I am Ahaya Yalahayim. So the law is for whoever comes to serve Ahaya Yalahayim. The law pertains to us all. Now, when looking at issues between beast and beast, all right, we're going into another variable. Let's look at that in Exodus 21, 35 and 36, please. And if one man's ox hurt another's, that he die, then they shall sell the live ox and divide the money of it, and the dead ox also they shall divide. Or if it be known that the ox hath used to push in time past, and his owner hath not kept him in, he shall surely pay ox for ox, and the dead shall be his own. That's the simplicity of death by negligence or mishap unknowingly. And we see the accountability Allah Haim holds us to. If we know better, we got to do better. All right. Anything else there, Zach? No, I'm good. All right. Let's jump into the laws pertaining to servants or employees, if you will. Exodus 21 and 20, please. And if a man smite his servant or his maid with a rod, and he die under his hand, he shall surely be punished. And that's murder. So he has to die for slaying him. All right. Continue, please. Notwithstanding, if he continue a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he is his money. If he live, he isn't worthy of death. But depending on how he hurt him, the servant can go out free from the abusive master. Can you read... Exodus 21, verse 26 and 27, please. And if a man smite the eye of his servant or the eye of his maid, that it perish, he shall let him go free for his eye's sake. And if he smite his manservant's tooth or his maidservant's tooth, he shall let him go free for his tooth's sake. So physical abuse is a grounds for separating and letting servants go. All right. We see here, we know the calling of the faith or the fruits of the spirit to do all things in gentleness, temperance, meekness, long-suffering. Masters are called on to be better than what we see here. And we have to be mindful as masters and servants that whatever we do, we do it unto the Lord in maintaining the fruits of the spirit. Can you read Colossians 3, verse 23 to 25, please? Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily, as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. So, whether master or servant, we're supposed to do what's right and not be abusing, physically abusing, mentally abusing, emotionally abusing, or verbally abusing anyone, even if they are employee. All right? Let's see the admonitions for masters to do good unto their servants. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9, and Colossians 4 and 1, please. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 9. And ye masters, do the same things unto them, for bearing threatening, knowing that your master also is in heaven, neither is there respect the persons with him. Amen. Oh. Amen. Can you please? Uh -huh. Colossians chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Amen. So a master has to be mindful to do what's just and equal, not being abusive, treating their servants well. And if things aren't working out with the servant, 
separate from the servant. As it says, cast out the scorner and strife and reproach shall cease. All right, so we see Elohim is without respect of person and he's looking upon us all. Masters, we have admonitions on how to treat servants well for our benefit and theirs. All right, can you read Sirach? Chapter 7, verse 20 to 21, and then chapter 33, verse 30 and 31, please. So, right, chapter 7, verse 20. Whereas thy servant worketh truly, and treat him not evil, nor the hireling that bestoweth himself wholly for thee, let thy soul love a good servant, and defraud him not of liberty. So, right, chapter 33, verse 30. If thou have a servant, let him be unto thee as thyself, because thou hast bought him with a price. If thou have a servant, entreat him as a brother, for thou hast need of him, and as of thy own soul. If thou entreat him evil, and he run from thee, which way will thou go to seek him? All right. Don't treat people right. They're going to end up leaving. All right, so we're going to do well. And servants, our calling in the faith is given to us as well when it comes to our employers. Uh, Ephesians 6, verse 5 to 8, please. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, and singleness of your heart as unto Christ. Not with eye service as men pleases, but as the servant of Christ, doing the will of Elohim from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Knowing that whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall he receive of the Lord, whether he be bond or free. All right. So praise the Lord for his guidance. All right. On what we ought to do. Now, anything else there, Zachwa? No, I thought it was good. Amen. Praise Allah. Now, let's look at killing with intent, which is murder. Can you read Leviticus 24 and 17, please? And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. All right. Let's get into understanding what this is talking about. Numbers chapter 35, verse 16. We got to look at it because, remember, killing a person in general it depends on what was transpiring, how it happened. So we need the precepts for edification. In Numbers 35, verse 16 to 21, please. And if he smite him with an instrument of iron so that he die, he is a murderer. And the murderer shall surely be put to death. And if he smite him with throwing a stone wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a murderer, and the murderer shall be put to death. Or if he smite him with an hand weapon of wood, wherewith he may die, and he die, he is a murderer, and the murderer shall be put to death. The revenger of blood himself shall slay the murderer, when he meeteth him, and he shall slay him. That slain of the murderer? Is weighed as righteous before Allah for slaying the wicked, as we read about before. Continue, please. But if he thrust him of hatred or hurl at him by lying of weight, that he die, or an enmity smite him with his hand, that he die, he that smote him shall surely be put to death. For he is a murderer. The revenger of blood shall slay the murderer when he meeteth him. So we see, ill intent slaying is worthy of death. Now, if there are witnesses to a murder, there must be more than one witness for the accusation to stand. Can you read Numbers 35, verse 30 and 31, please? Whoso killeth any person, the murderer shall be put to death by the mouth of witnesses. But one witness shall not testify against any person to cause him to die. Moreover, ye shall take no satisfaction for the life of a murderer, 
which is guilty of death, but he shall be surely put to death. All right. These are the laws to help us understand. Now, we're going to touch on these things again. We're going through it all, and then we're going to come back around. So we're not just, we're not done talking about it, just so we know. Now, let's look at the inadvertent killing without the intent to kill or harm to see the difference. Can we read Numbers 35, verse 14 and 15, please? You shall give three cities on this side of Jordan, and three cities shall you give to the land of Canaan, which shall be cities of refuge. These six cities shall be a refuge, both for the children of Israel and for the stranger, and for the sojourner among them, that every one that killeth any person unawares may flee thither. Right. Inadvertent slains aren't worthy of death in itself. Let's continue learning in Numbers 35, verse 22 to 29, please. But if he thrust him suddenly without enmity, or have cast upon him anything without laying of weight, or with any stone wherewith a man may die, seeing him not, and cast it upon him that he died, and was not his enemy, neither sought his harm. Then the congregation shall judge between the slayer and the revenger of blood according to these judgments. And the congregation shall deliver the slayer out of the hand of the revenger of blood, and the congregation shall restore him to the city of his refuge, whether he was fled. And he shall abide in it unto the death of the high priest which was anointed with the holy oil. But if the slayer shall at any time come without the border of the city of his refuge, whether he was fled, and the revenger of blood find him without the borders of the city of his refuge, and the revenger of blood kill the slayer, he shall not be guilty of blood. Because he should have remained in the city of his refuge unto the death of the high priest. But after the death of the high priest, the slayer shall return into the land of his possession. So these things shall be for a statute of judgment unto you throughout your generations and all your dwellings. That's the righteousness of the law in these situations. Inadvertent killing isn't worthy of death or imprisonment. But living in a foreign city of refuge for the duration of the high priest's life is the judgment and should be carried out. And you see that the slayer, if he leaves that city before the time, he is worthy of death because he should, in his remorse, he should have stayed where he was because he killed somebody inadvertently, you know. So the person, if they catch him, they're not guilty of blood in that instance. Do you know why that is, Kappa? I do not. Why is it? Do tell, please. Well, those six cities, who's governing those six cities? The priests and the judges? Right. So it would be Alahim's people, right? Yes. Right. So those six cities may be following a different law than the law of different lands. So that's why when you go into that city, you're protected in that city because of the law. Whereas if you go out of that city, it may be a different governor over that city, which is operating under another law. Ah, he went away from Alahir's protection. Right. And left them vulnerable. The showing the accountability to stay within the law. Like it'll protect us for real in any situation. So that's why we had those cities to go in cases like this that the people are on one accord in those cities knowing that we're going to be surrounded by even it says it's a place for refuge for the sojourner and for the um for the stranger so you can mm -hmm. see that other people were governing different areas so if a person was a stranger or a sojourner um, they could actually flee to those cities that are keeping the law too so it, it was helpful for everyone, Jew and Gentile. Okay. 
Sound like I am. Praise him. He's righteous. Let's finish out the laws pertaining to the flee the slayer who flees to a city of refuge and has to remain there until the high priest dies. Numbers thirty five thirty two, please. And you shall take no satisfaction for him that is fled to the city of his refuge, that he shall come again to dwell in the land unto the death of the priest. You shall not pollute the land wherein you are, for blood it defileth the land, and the land cannot be cleansed of the blood that is shed therein, but by the blood of him that shed it. Defile not therefore the land which ye shall inhabit, wherein I dwell, for I, Ahiah, dwell among the children of Israel. Huh. I think there's some understanding also of why we shall take no satisfaction for the murderer not to be put to death, or to take satisfaction for the fleer to the city of refuge to return to his land that he had dwelt because those processes are what's needed to cleanse the land. The land is cleansed by blood when blood is shed. So the murderer had to be put to death to cleanse the land. But then for the inadvertent slaying, he did it inadvertently. So he has to leave the land. So there's a healing Allah Hayyam does himself by him waiting until the death of the high priest to cleanse the land. That's why he can't go back and we shouldn't have satisfaction to have him go back. We're going to actually go against Allah Hayyam and his process. Is that making sense? That's correct. That's why if he goes back into the land, it's not accounted unto the revenger because it only fulfilled the law of the land with the blood going back. So he didn't give time for the high priest to actually atone the land. All right. This is a good understanding of how Allah thoughts are above our thoughts. And though we don't know everything as to why he commands what he commands, we have the trust to understand he wants what's best for us all. He's a lover of souls. So what he tells us to do, there's a reason. Though we may not see it or understand it, there's a reason to do what he says to do in everything. Amen. Holy Allah. Now, in regards to revenging blood by killing the murderer, we've seen what the law says. Yet, we know Yache came to bring grace and truth. And we aren't to avenge ourselves. We put things in the Lord's hands, not our own. Romans chapter 12, verse 19, please. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So though a person is worthy of death, for murder we can't go avenge the blood because we have also sinned and cannot cast the stone so that person they're in the hands of Allah Hayyam, who knows the hearts and will bring them to repentance or he will judge them for their works all right can you read hebrews chapter 10 verse 28 to 31 please he that despised moses law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much more sore punishment suppose ye shall ye be thought worthy who have trodden underfoot the son of Elohim, and have counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and have done despite unto the spirit of grace for we know him that hath said vengeance belongeth unto me I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living Allah. 
It truly is. So we do not judge or revenge blood ourselves, but leave it in Allah's hands under the grace of Christ in hopes that that person comes to repentance. All right. Remember we said we was going to touch back on that. We want to make sure we complete the understanding that self-defense having to kill someone is self-defense that's righteous all right if someone murders someone we are not to revenge blood because vengeance belonging to the lord it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of allah Hayim and let allah Hayim take care of that situation and if we kill someone inadvertently According to law, we have to go to the city of refuge and abide there so that the land may be cleansed according to the law of Allah. Okay. Now, looking at the spirits at work in murdering, looking getting into the spiritual aspect, we saw hatred was in a person to kill. This spirit stirs up the mind to kill someone. Can you read Testament of Gad, chapter 6, verse 2, please? But in the presence of my father, I spoke peaceably to Joseph. And when I had gone out, the spirit of hatred darkened my mind and stirred up my soul to slay him. So we see one spirit at work with the intent to kill. Now, let's identify the spirit behind it all that leads to killing someone with ill intent. Can you read Testament of Dan, chapter 1, verse 5 to 8, please? And I rejoice that he was sold, because his father loved him more than us. For the spirit of jealousy and vainglory said to me, Thou thyself also art his son. And one of the spirits of Belial stirred me up, saying, Take this sword, and with it slay Joseph. So shall thy father love thee when he is dead. Now this is the spirit of anger that persuaded me to crush Joseph as a leopard crush of a kid. So hatred stirs a soul to slay. And it's anger that persuades to slay someone. It uses hatred of heart to make a person envious to blind their mind to do the evil act. Can you read Testament to Dan chapter 2, verse 4 to 5, please? For the spirit of anger encompassed him with the net of deceit, and blindeth his eyes, and through lying darkeneth his mind, and giveth him its own peculiar vision, and wherewith encompasseth it his eyes with hatred of heart, so as to be envious of his brother. Interestingly, we know these precepts are true. Because Cain was the first murderer in the flesh, and he murdered his brother out of envy. So you can understand the spirits that led him to that envy, the hatred and the anger. Okay. Hence, anger used jealousy and vainglory, which is a self-pleasing pride and a hateful spirit, to overtake Dan to act in the hatred of his heart. Now as we talked about how the Lord came to bring grace and truth and to bring understanding for us to keep away from these spirits. The Lord came to teach us how to overcome the spirits behind killing so as not to even give in to those spirits to be led astray by the spirit's persuasions to hurt someone unjustly. Can you read Matthew 5 verse 21 and 22 please? You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. But I say unto you, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Hopefully you understand why he said that now. That's the spirit that leads to killing unjustly. Hence, one's given into it without a cause, we're in danger with Allah for hearkening to idols. All right, continue, please. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. You're calling them worthless, which shows hatred is in your heart because we're all Allah's creation. 
the definition, the Greek for raka, well, coming from the, the Hebrew word from a Chaldean origin, it means in G4469, going to H7386, for comparison, it means, O oh, empty one, that is, thou worthless, as a term of utter vilification. Okay? Also, empty, senseless, empty-headed man. Okay? So, saying that already shows the spirits that work in us. Okay? We know the heart of the proud stirreth of strife, and out of the heart cometh evil things. Okay? Continue with the edification. Yeah, was given, please. Um, On that one... Oh, sorry. No, no, you're good. On that one, we have more words nowadays that actually correspond with that. So, like, calling somebody, you know, stupid or um, any word of that nature... It's the same spirit behind it, though it may be a different word, just for understanding's sake in modern times. Thank you. So please look up the synonyms to stupid to make sure we're aware of what this stuff could be talking about. You know, dumb, anything like that, it's, it all goes into the same thing. Um, but whosoever shall say, thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Hatred is in your heart to be cruel to a person, not seeing Allah Hayim in all his creation. So that puts us in danger of the hellfire for hearkening to idols. Continue in verse 23, please. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remember that thy brother hath ought against thee, Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Go rectify our faults before coming to offer to Allah Hayim. Continue, please. Agree with thine adversary quickly, while if thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge. And the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. So understand, not giving place to anger, to fulfill its will, is essential to keeping the law and keeping us out of trouble with Allah Hayim and the punishment that goes with for hearkening to those spirits. Can you touch on the edification lightly for staying away from anger and hatred and such? Ephesians 4, 26 and 27, please. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. If we get into wrath or anger, the devil uses it to blind us through the hatred of heart unto envy, which will get us in danger of judgment or worse, and it can lead to someone bearing grudges, being unforgiven, and even someone's death, as we've seen through the discussion here today. Can you read Sirach 28, verse 3 to 6, please? If you don't mind, I want to touch on that. Okay, please. Um, There are going to be scenarios in life where you are going to get angry. That's why the scripture says, be ye angry and sin not. So there are going to be scenarios where you do get angry because anger is rash. It's, um, it's, it's um, hasty. So that may be your first reaction or that may, what that may be what happens inside of you. But you're supposed to gather yourself and get yourself together and not operate in that anger. That's why I said, be ye angry and sin not. Because if you actually operate in the anger, that's where you actually fall into sin. So that's why I says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Because you're actually supposed to gather yourself and actually get through it. Anger is not something that you want to continue going on with. It's something that you want to take the time, stop what you're doing, and actually deal with it. 
so that you can actually overcome it or calm down or gather yourself to then go forward. You don't want to just go forward in that anger because then it gets placed to the devil to operate in you so that you can actually understand the fullness of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 and 27 and what it's saying, okay? So we want to make sure that we actually gather ourselves and actually deal with it so that we can actually calm down and, and sort through that anger and actually either we have to forgive that person or you have to gather yourself to a place of peace where you can actually go and talk to the person to sort things out. Okay. Thank you. You can reference the lesson on anger and wisdom in all relationships, walking in wisdom in all relationships for understanding in depth of dealing with these situations and such. When you're ready, you can read Sirach 28, verse 3 to 6, please. Okay. When one man beareth hatred against another, and doeth he seek pardon from the Lord? He showeth no mercy to a man which is like himself, and doeth he ask forgiveness of his own sins. If he that is but flesh nerveth hatred, who will entreat for pardon of his sins? Remember thy end, and let enmity cease. Remember corruption and death, and abide in the commandments. That's a part of what, Zach, well, you were just talking about in reasoning and dealing with it and not, not letting the sun go down upon your wrath. Consider who's going to entreat for me if I'm nourishing hatred, if I'm angry and such. Remember that abide in the commandments. Sirach 28 and 2 and 7, please. Forgive thy neighbor the hurt that he have done unto thee. So shall thy sins also be forgiven when thou prayest. Remember the commandments and bear no malice to thy neighbor. Remember the covenant of the highest and wink at ignorance. Man. It's, a, it's interesting that with, for one... When you get angry, don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. We well, talked about dealing with it before the sun goes down, getting through it. And then also forgiving what was done so that we can be forgiven when we pray. This We are supposed to pray by the time the sun is going down. So Allah Hayim is giving us laws and admonitions to help us not let a day go by where we give place to the devil. So, yeah, because if it lingers, it grows. If I allow it to sit in me, then it's only going to fester. It's only going to have my mind thinking about it. I'm going to go, I'm going to start um, projecting scenarios. I'm going to start projecting intents of people. I'm going to, it get, it's a playground for the devil. So if I don't forgive it and I don't actually sort through it, then it's only going to give place to the devil in me. All right. All right, correct. We talked about that in the bride lesson, that it's the spirit of wickedness that projects you can see we get angry we let the sun go down upon it we didn't deal with it now the anxiety is there because we're flustered or frustrated or bothered about what's going on then it gives wickedness place to push out those evil thoughts in wisdom of solomon seventeen eleven, it said for wickedness condemned by her own witness is very timorous and being pressed with conscience always forecasted grievous things. So then the evil thoughts come, the projections, seeing the person according to what we think or taking it how we think they meant it instead of having the conversations or letting the things go to be able to be at peace. So that's just... That's true. That's why it says wink at ignorance. 
because some things aren't a big enough deal. Some things aren't a big deal. Some things you can let go. And some things you need to actually deal with and have a conversation about. So you definitely have to pick and choose your battles and in, in, in wisdom. And that's hatred you have to watch out for because hatred makes small things great. So you can see how the spirits, anger, hatred, envy, wickedness, pride, causing the, a lot of the trouble we're seeing in the world today. Like, say, for instance, you like your clothes folded a certain way and somebody doesn't fold your clothes the right way and you get angry. Like, wink at ignorance. Yeah. Like, don't let pride get into the midst of you or anger or hatred, you know? So those are things that you can pick and choose. You've got to be able to wink at ignorance because it's one it's your it's your iniquity that you're actually placing on them. Though you may like something a certain way, you still can't control other people. Other people are gonna do things their way. And it's it gets very, very touchy where as a believer and as a person that's growing in the faith, you should get more, you should get further away from your own desires and the things that you like and be cleaving more into the commandments and the things that Allah likes so that everybody is on the same page and everybody can be in unity and harmony with one another. But when you have those certain things that you desire, that's not according to what Allah is looking for, then it causes that contention. It causes that anger. It causes that hatred. So we have to be very mindful to not give ourselves over to our own desires so that we can actually be at peace with one another in Allah Hayyam. So it. Amen. That ties in with long suffering where Allah Hayyam dwells. And long suffering overcomes anger so that we can overcome it so as not to transgress the law of Allah Hayyam that he gave in the sixth commandment not to kill, and also the law Yahshe gave, not to be angry without a cause, and to forgive, and not judge, so that we be not judged, nor condemned, so that we be not condemned, because what measure we meet will be measured out to us, all right? And also his command to forgive every other one from the heart, that we may be forgiven. Hermas Mandate 5, chapter 1, verse 1, please. Be thou long suffering and understanding, he saith, and thou shalt have the mastery over all evil deeds and shalt work all righteousness. This commandment is simple, but it's essential because that right there, long suffering and understanding, will overcome all evil and lead us to all righteousness. So it's a good focal point to make sure. Understand first before speaking. Understand first without going into personal opinions, but understand the whole thing. What the person, what transpired, what the person was thinking, how it went, and then understand according to the law, not based on how we feel. And be long-suffering with the person and with ourselves. And we will get the mastery. And work our righteousness. Anything on that, Zachma? No, I'm good. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. A follow-up assignment to this is to check out the lesson on anger. It's essential. And walking in wisdom in our relationships. Specifically, the spirit of anger lesson, so you can find it. Thank you. I'm sorry. Now, let's finish up on understanding things that can transpire. Fight in between people. Let's look at that in Exodus 21 and 18 and 19, please. And if men strive together and one smite another with a stone or with his fist and he die not, 
but keepeth his bed, if he rise again and walk abroad upon his staff, then shall he that smote him be quit. Only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. So, Elohim's accountable. You hurt somebody, you got to pay for the what they lost during that time. They couldn't go to work. And also, you got to make sure they get healed. So, he's all about accountability. Okay. And as you could imagine, they got into a fight. They gave into the wrong spirits. So, <laughs> there's accountability there. <laughs> Right. So also be able to talk things out, be well and communicate. Mm -hmm. Now let's see when there's a fight and women gets involved, how that goes. Can we read Deuteronomy twenty five, verse eleven and twelve, please? When men strive together one with another, and the wife of the one draweth near for to deliver her husband out of the hand of him that smiteth him and putteth forth her hand, and taketh him by the secrets. Then shalt thou cut off her hand, thy eye shall not pity her. So women ought not to grab men by the secrets. Elohim gave the law, be mindful not to do it. Now of course we are not to avenge ourselves, she's in Elohim's hands. He will hopefully bring her to repentance if she does that. Or whatever may follow, we know whatever Elohim does is just. It may be what's going to help her come to repentance. So now, if men are fighting and a woman gets hurt and she's pregnant, let's see what the law says. Exodus 21, verse 22 to 25, please. If men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. All right. The child came out. Thankfully, the child lived, yet he messed up the process. So he has to pay that man what the judges determine. Continue, please. And if any mischief follow, thou shalt give life for life. So if the baby dies, the person who hurt the woman ought to die for causing the baby's death. Of course, we know vengeance belongs to Allah Hayim. He's going to be in Allah Hayim's hands for that. All right, continue, please. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, Stripe for stripe. We're going to get into understanding this retaliation of rendering evil for evil. Can you read Leviticus 24, verse 19 to 20, please? And if a man cause a blemish in his neighbor, as he hath done, so shall it be done to him. Breach for breach, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, as he hath caused a blemish in a man so shall it be done to him again. Yache came to bring the grace and truth of this law. So let's look into it. Matthew 5, verse 38 and 39, please. You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. He taught not to render evil for evil. All right. Is there anything else there with that, Zappa? Yes, he's just saying don't take vengeance into your own hands and allow Allah to do the avenging. And if somebody's going to mistreat you, he's saying don't go back and render unto them. You know, just forgive them and and go on about your way. That's what it means when he says, turn the other cheek also. It doesn't mean to let them keep hitting you or punishing you. It means that you're forgiving them and you turn the other cheek. It's like, okay, you may have hit me on this side, but this side, 
it's still fine and I'm going to I'm going to depart. <laughs> it means to leave. <laughs> Get out of the situation. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, and and not rendering evil for evil and not taking it personal, but forgiving them. We have the admonitions he gave through his apostle in Romans twelve seventeen, please. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. It's interesting because it would be an evil recompense to think evilly, to hold a grudge. Even if we don't act on it because the spirits at work in holding a grudge, in being bitter, in resenting a person for something they did. It's evil. So Allah wants us to let go of all of it and do things honestly in the sight of all. Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 15, please. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Amen. That's the simplicity of Christ. Follow that which is good amongst us in the faith and also amongst all men in the world to be an example of Christ no matter what is going on. And hope this edification is good. Zach, or anything else? Uh, yeah, in Matthew 5 and 39, he says that ye resist not evil. He's talking about taking matters into thy own hands. So let us not take matters into our own hands, but instead give it unto Allah and allow Allah to actually deal with it and forgive them. Even if they don't repent unto you or apologize, Still forgive them for your own heart and your own conscience and your own soul's sake so that evil spirits may not have place to dwell in you. So, and, and stay in that forgiveness. Don't just do a lighthearted forgiveness, but inside of you, you're still harboring hatred and anger toward that person. You actually have to truly forgive for your soul's sake so that you can actually go forward and walk in the fruit of the spirit. Amen. That's essential because God showed us a spirit of hatred that holds that guile in the heart, not truly forgiven. It's essential. Touching on business dealings, we have commandments as well to help in the midst of all this. Can we read Leviticus 19 and 13, please? Thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. The wages of him that is hired shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. So, masters, pay your servants on time. And if you have it, pay them. Don't tell them, go, and tomorrow I will give when thou hast it by thee, as the proverb speaks of. That's not right. And the reason people need to be paid on time is because, Sirach 34.21 Bread of the needy is their life. He that defraudeth him thereof is a man of blood. People are dependent on these things for their necessities, their bread, their their clothing, a roof over their head. They need their payment. A person that defrauds a person doesn't pay them on time or doesn't pay them at all is a man of blood. All right, continue, please. He that taketh away his neighbor's living slayeth him. And he that defraudeth the laborer of his hire is a bloodshedder. So these people are also killers or murderers as well by not paying on time or taking away the things people need for their living. And as we get understanding, we are not to avenge ourselves or take matters into our own hands. If we see that someone isn't dealing right, they're taking our stuff or not paying us like they're supposed to, can't take it on to Allah and put it in his hands to put you in a better situation. We don't just take off, cast all our cares upon Allah for he careth for you. Make your prayer with supplication and be careful for nothing. Don't be anxious. Tell Allah what's going on and pray for deliverance and wait for his deliverance from that situation. Just as the children of Israel had to wait for their deliverance out of Egypt. Zakwa. Uh, help me 
in case I didn't speak that thoroughly. Well, it was thorough. Okay. Um, the thing is, is according to the law, we're supposed to pay whoever we hire that day when they complete the work. So say a person is doing a job, um, you will pay them when the work is complete or you will pay them that day. Um, so, so if you hire someone to work for you that day, you would pay them that day. If you hire someone to do a big job for you that requires days of work and labor, when they're finished with that job, they get paid. You don't keep the money, right? So in this world, um, that's not abiding in the commandments. We have jobs where we work every day and we're not getting paid every day. So you can see how it's actually, um, they're actually not keeping the commandment. Yeah. Like we're not getting paid for jobs. A lot, some of us are. Some of us, our jobs are actually where we actually do a job and we get paid at the end of the job, which is actually by the commandment. But many of us work every day and we complete our tasks for that day and we don't get paid. We may, it may take seven, it may take 14, it may take 30 days to get paid, which is actually not according to the commandment. What should be done if they, if an owner truly is unable to pay a person, talk with the person, they should communicate set up a payment plan to pay all correct if they're not able to pay it they should actually speak with you and actually try to do their best to compensate but if they have it by them according to law they're supposed to give it to you okay so just touching on that matter to get it all together since we're talking about understanding being bloodshedders and such to know how business aspect also plays into that as well. All right. Praise Allah. I hope this was edifying and remember to check out the spirit of anger lesson, walking the wisdom in all relationships and hope this helps build for us all in the faith. We'll catch y'all on the next law class. Peace be with you. Shalom. HRC, 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 Hebrew readers, Hebrew readers, Hebrew readers, church.